All right, good morning, guys. Uh, happy Friday to you, and today I'm going to walk you through some phylogeny and systematics. Uh, before we do that, it seems like you guys always get a kick out of me changing my screen all the time. I found this one for home, so I thought I'd show this uh, to everybody. It would be a really good one for forensic science now that I see it. Uh, and to go along with the great night that we've had so far, congratulations to the Tigers. They are moving on to the World Series. So um, make sure you check that out next week, but don't stay up too late because you guys got a lot of AP stuff to work on. All right, I'll stop trying to be funny. I'll actually get down to business because I'm more boring on camera than I am on uh, in real life, so I might as well stop trying to, trying to fake that. So today you're going to look at phylogeny systematics, then I'm going to have you guys work on what we call a cladogram. At the end of this video, I'll show you how to make the cladogram, and then we'll, uh, you'll have some time to work on that. And if you get done with things ahead of time, you'll be able to work on getting your study guides from chapters 23 through 25 taken care of. And the cladogram is going to act as your study guide for chapter 25. All right, so phy phylogeny and systematics are very similar to one another, but I guess before we get into that, you can see here the little note about slideshows from Kim Foley, I believe is how you pronounce it. She is a great contributor to the AP community. She was one of the, the main people that helped to get new teachers familiarized with the content and gave a lot of great feedback for teachers to help them become better AP teachers. And unfortunately, she passed away here recently. And so um, may she rest in peace. All right, so phylogeny systematics, what we're really looking at is the establishment of um, family trees and how organisms are related to one another uh, based upon um, many different things, and that's going to be the, the main topic we're going to be looking at. So when you look at the human here, you look at the mushroom, and you look at the flower. You know, when you just eyeball a mushroom and a flower, they appear to be very similar because they both grow from the ground, they both take water in through roots, they have many similar morphologic um, characteristics to one another. However, now that we have better um, technology and we're able to look at more molecular similarities, what we're finding out is that the fungi here is actually more closely related to the human than it is to the plants. While the process of studying this and figuring this all this all this out about similarities in molecular structures and uh, primarily DNA and RNA is what we uh, put into the categories of phylogeny and systematics. And so the two work um, hand in hand. And then just a cool picture of a um, dragonfly fossil as well. So to break down these two terms, phylogeny is how we look at the evolutionary history of the species. All right, so when we're talking about phylogeny, we're looking at how things evolve from a common ancestor. Some of the best evidence we have of evolution from common ancestors we look at the fossil record, and so we'll spend some time looking at the, the fossil record here um, shortly. We look at morphological, so outer appearances, and then also biochemical resemblances. Like, you know, examples of that include how all the macromolecules, your carbohydrates, your proteins, um, your nucleic acids, as well as your um, lipids, are structurally similar in all organisms. And then we also look at molecular evidence, where we concentrate more on the DNA and the RNA. I, and then working kind of side by side with this is the, the field of systematics. Systematics is looking at how we classify organisms. And so when we look at phylogeny and we then uh, classify those organisms based on that phylogeny, that's a field that we call systematics. So moving on. And if at any point I'm going too fast, obviously pause the video so you can finish taking any notes you want to take. And I'm pleased to do me a favor today. Take record any notes that you, or excuse me any questions that you may have so that uh, we can discuss those questions when I return on Monday. Uh, you're also welcome to, to text me those questions if whoever's coming from me today is willing to uh, let you do so. All right, so when we're looking at phylogeny, like it shows here, some of the different pieces of evidence that we have that things have evolved from a common ancestor, it's a fossil record. The biggest piece of the fossil record that we're going to look at, we need to look inside the sedimentary rock. Because remember, sedimentary rock is the rock that forms as a result of layering um, at different times of um, sands and soils. All right? The fossil record, while it is quite substantial, and we have many, 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 many fossils to, to work upon and, and to use to help us out with studying this, we have to keep in mind that it's also incomplete. 
So there are missing pieces there. And so um, when you have people that kind of challenge the whole uh, evolutionary theory, this is one of the holes that they try to shoot in is the fact that we don't have a complete record, record um, showing how things have completely changed over time. All right, so this is kind of a, a spotty historical documentation of the world of biology. All right, but one of the big things we are able to get out of the fossil record is the fact that we have all kinds of evidence to show that there's been what we call punctuated equilibrium at various times throughout the um, history of the Earth. And so what that means is we go long periods of time with very little evolution, and then we have rapid um, times of evolution which are often um, up here as or often during these times we see mass extinctions occurring. You, know, you can think of the dawn of the dinosaurs and then you know, things slowly evolved over time and then after the um, dinosaurs went away we had rapid evolution occurring for a period of time then things slowed back down as well. So just kind of a, a cool picture showing um, an example of a fossil. You know, mummification is an example of a fossil record, and this one was found up in, let's see here, the, uh, an alpine ridge, so up in the mountains, about 10,500 feet above sea level. And they estimated that using most likely carbon dating because of the age, that it's approximately 500 years old. All right, so um, back in the 90s, Jurassic Park was a big thing. And so uh, Jurassic Park was really the, the movie that kind of put paleontology on the forefront. And, got it to be, rather than just kind of a science geek thing, it became more of a mainstream thing, similar to how the CSI shows have turned forensic science from being a geeky thing into a, a, a mainstream society thing. Well, paleontology is, as you can see here, the study of fossils. All right, and these fossils help us to see that there have been changes that have happened to organisms over uh, the history of life. All right, and so we use this to help show that there's linkage between current organisms as well as past organisms. You, know, you can see the example here of some fossilized woolly mammoth tusks. Well, obviously those are going to show a link between the tusk of the woolly mammoth and the, the tusk of the modern-day elephants as well as other organisms. When we're looking at these fossils, just a reminder on a little bit of earth science, we're going to get into the, the rock jocks here. We're, we're looking at layering of sedimentary rocks. And the lower you are in those layers, the older the rock is. So you can see here we have a, a river basin and as the river basin continues to um, add additional layers of soil, it's going to cause fossilized organisms to get stuck in various layers of soil. Once that starts to wear away, so let's say the, the water is receding here, and then it starts to wear away, we might get, uh, for instance, a river going through here that's going to wear away at some of those, and they call them strata. And when we look in there, we might find fossilized remains. Some of the fossil, fossilized remains here at the bottom, those are going to be your older organisms. The ones that you find closer to the surface are going to be your younger organisms, keeping in mind it's a system where it just keeps stacking on top of another. All right? So just some cool examples of some fossils. Pretty large um, bone here. Um, this guy's checking out. See the fossilized skull. Um, a petrified tree is an example of a uh, fossil. We can see the um, pretty well-preserved scorpion here inside of um, some amber, so some fossilized tree sap, a little basis behind the Jurassic Park movies. Uh, sometimes our fossils are not actually the organisms. They're the impression that's left by the organisms. And you can see that here with this leaf. And then finally we can see some sort of mollusk that uh, was fossilized as well. All right, so when we're going through and we're analyzing all this, what we're looking for are similarities in their structures, in terms of the, their physical structures, as well as their molecular structures. And when we find similarities between those, we call those homologies. All right, and um, we got to be careful when we're using the term homology because there's, it's pretty specific. When you're talking homology, what you're looking at is examples of divergent evolution. So homology helps to show that you had divergent evolution occur, which means you had a common ancestor and then that separated in the evolutionary tree, and you now have two structures in these two different species that are similar to one another because of the fact they came from a common ancestor. You know, we already talked about a um, good example of homologous structures being looking at the bone structure inside the wing of a bat 
and compared to the bone structure inside the flipper of a whale compared to the bone structure inside um, under our skin of the human hand. All of those are very similar to one another because we have evolved from a common ancestor. We got to be careful because that's different than what we call an analogous structure. An analogous structure is a structure that's going to be found on organisms that are more undergoing convergent evolution. They're getting these, uh, these characteristics that are similar to one another, even though they didn't come from uh, a common ancestor. Another good example of that one, we looked at the sugar glider and we looked at the American flying squirrel, the American flying squirrel. Both have similar morphological characteristics. They are able to glide through the air. However, they did not come from a common ancestor. They have evolved separate from one another, but over time, they are evolving more to having more of these characteristics that are similar to one another. So more, or excuse me, homology goes with divergent evolution. Analogous goes with convergent evolution. And so you can see here the marsupial soul and the placental mole. Um, they have evolved separately from one another. Therefore, these are more examples of having analogous structures rather than convergent structures. I sure hope I didn't mess that up. I'm going to look that up after I'm done here. If I did, I'll get back to you on that one. All right. One of the biggest things we look at now, because technology allows us to do so, are we look for molecular homologies. All right. What we're talking about there is we're looking at the DNA sequences. The more common, the more commonality we find in the DNA, the more similar those organisms are to one another. And all, and so with today's technology, we can have a computer do all this for us. You know, we, we've digitized this whole process. We can find, we can determine the genome of an entire organism um, much more quickly than having people sitting in a lab. Okay, there's a seed, there's an A, there's a T. We run it through the computer. The, the Human Genome Project, I, I can't remember the exact dates off the top of my head, but it was expected to be about a 15-year process. But because of the advancements in technology, they got it done in seven years. And so now they've been able to go through and see, okay, the entire human genome, on chromosome 1, we have these um, genes. Chromosome 2, we have these genes. Chromosome 3, we have that. In fact, I have a poster in the room. You guys should check it out sometime. It's on the... Um, side of, is on the, I gotta think my way through this, the east side of the room, over by the windows. Um, but when we go through and look at this, what we're looking for is similarities. All right, and so uh, we, we'll take a look at this going through here. So we have these two organisms that have a common ancestor. And then when evolution occurred, uh, what happened was with one of the organisms, or with one of the populations, there was a deletion that occurred that altered the, the DNA sequence. So we can see here the DNA sequence is now C, C, A, T, C, A, and instead of being a G, now all of this here slides to the left. All right, in the other uh, population, what we've seen is maybe we had an insertion happen here between the T and the C. And so now we have C, C, A, T, and we have this full GTA that's been inserted, and it goes on down the line. Everything's been bumped over as a result of that. What we're able to do, and more easily now, because of everything being automated, we can go through and analyze where are the similarities. And if we make breaks here, so we can say, okay, it's different here, but what happens if we slide this over? Will we find more commonality? Well, you can see if I take this C-A-A-G-T-C-C and slide it over, oh, look at the C and the A line up again. And maybe if I take the AGTC slider, oh, look at the AGTCC slides over, and it lines up. And so when we do this with two common organ or two similar organisms, we can see, you know what, there's a great degree of similarity between those. Something happened over the course of time to make it so that this did change, but for the most part, they still have very similar structures or very similar nucleotide sequences in their DNA. And so they go through and we analyze this. And so you've heard me say, say in the um, class before, 99% similar in terms of the DNA structure to this. Or, I mean, you gotta be careful what you determine, where they're talking about DNA similarity versus amino acid similarity. Because remember, it takes three nucleotides of DNA to make, um, to give the instructions for making, or for, excuse me, for bringing into a protein 
one particular amino acid. Alright, so once again, if you have questions with this, make sure you jot your questions down so that we can talk about those when we return on Monday. Alright, so now if we lean more towards the systematics, we already spent quite a bit of time talking about classification. Alright, so when we talk systematics, we're looking at taking this classification and applying it to uh, fly phylogeny. The whole Linnaean system that we discussed already, already does that for us. That's the whole basis behind the system. You know, we call it binomial nomenclature. So it's a binomial system where we have a genus name as the first name and the um, scientific name and the species name as the second part of the, the scientific name. And so we've already talked about, you take the domains, you break them down into kingdoms. You take the kingdoms, you break them down into phylums. So you can say you took the Animalia kingdom, and we break that down. One of the phylums in the Animalia kingdom is the Chordata kingdom. We take the Chordata kingdom and we break it down. One of the classes of the Chordata family, or excuse me, phylum is the Mammalia class. Then we take that breakdown into orders. One of the orders of the Mammalia class is the car car Carnivora. Excuse me, I'm having a hard time speaking. That. I don't know why. All right, we take the Carnivora order. We can break that down into families. One of those families is the Philidae family, which is primarily the cats. Philidae, feline, right, kind of makes sense. We can take the Philidae family, break it down into the genus of different genuses. We have Panthera. And then the species for this particular leopard is Panthera partis. All right, and so we're, when we look at this, we're basing this on phylogeny. You break it into the various groups based upon the evolutionary changes that have happened between the members of the same family. Evolutionary changes that have happened between members of the same genus, members of the same phylum, so on and so forth. And I'm going to show you how to um, lay that out in what we call a cladogram here a little bit later on. So what you'll often see is they'll take this and they'll put this kind of into a tree format. You know, and it says building trees. Um, we often don't call these phylogenic trees. All right, so if we trace this tree here, you have the carnivora order. And so the carnivora order is broken down into the Felidae, as well as the Canidae and the Mustelidae. All right, what this means is at some point here, something caused evolution to occur. And you had some divergent evolution going on. Some of your organisms had the characteristics of the Felidae family. Some of your, your other organisms had the characteristics of either this family or this family. All right, and then once again, when these two, these two went one way, and then there was another evolutionary um, period that occurred that caused these two members to start having differences between them. And so an evolutionary change resulted in members that had the characteristics of this family and then characteristics of this family. And so this is essential. We can trace this back to show, okay, the domestic dog and the wolf are more closely related to one another. These are more closely related then to the otter and the skunk than they are to the leopard, or for that matter, any cat. So dogs, as we think of them, that we have at home, are more closely related to otters than they are to the cats that you may have at home. But all of these are members of the carnivora order. So I hope that makes a little bit of sense. I, when we set this up in a format similar to this, we call it a cladogram. Cladograms are probably the more common way you're going to see this, and this is what you're going to work on today in class. In a cladogram, you take all your organisms that are part of that classification of scheme that you're using, and you lay them out in a pretty analytic setting. So we take up this line here. All these organisms came from a common ancestor. All right, so when we look here, all of these from a common ancestor. Then, some of them started to develop vertebral columns. So all the organisms that have a vertebral column, or you know, to make that a little bit easier to recognize, all of us that have vertebra, we are above the line where it shows vertebra, a vertebral column. All right. Then all the organisms that have jaws, that develop jaws, are above it on this line as well. All the organisms that have four walking legs are above that mark. All the organisms that are developed in an amniotic egg are above that line. All the organisms that have developed hair are above that line. 
this is actually supposed to show the time, and not necessarily time, sometimes you'll see time put onto these, but the evolutionary changes, the sequence in which the changes occur. So this evolutionary change happened first, this one happened second, this one happened third, so on and so forth. So when I look at these organisms, I can actually trace my way back down as well. A salamander has four walking legs, it has jaws, and it has vertebrae. A turtle is developed in an amniotic app, has four walking legs, has jaws, has vertebrae. This, because it's not part of the ver vertebra, that means it must be an invertebrate. So it evolved separately at that point. Hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. Um, if not, like I said, we can, we can work more with that a little bit later on. All right, when we're looking at this systematic stuff, what we really want to do is try to apply the, the rule of what we call parsimony. And the rule of parsimony says when you're looking at possible evolutionary trends, because we don't always have a, uh, enough data to be able to specifically say it happened like this, when you have multiple um, possibilities, parsimony says look at the one that is the simplest explanation. And let's use that one as our basis. So when we're talking about evolution, when we're looking for the simplest explanation, we're looking for the fewest number of evolutionary events. All right, so when we look at these four species of birds, there's really three possible ways that these could have evolved differently from one another if they were to come from a, a common ancestor. You could have, they all came from a common ancestor. The ones, um, one and two, could have evolved independently of three and four. Or you could add one and three evolving independently of two and four. One and four evolving independently of two and uh, three. So there's three different possibilities. We want to try to find the one that is the simplest and go with that one. All right, so a better example of that is shown here. So if we look at this, we have, once again, common ancestor split up. And so this is actually going still with the, the birds we are just looking at. Each of these marks shows an evolutionary event. So if we're going to apply the rules of parsimony, we want the, the least number of evolutionary events. So here we have 10, here we have 9, we have 8. So we're going to use the law of parsimony. We're going to go with this one as being the um, evolutionary events that occurred to lead to the separation of those four species. All right, so when we look at this one here, which one of these shows the least amount of evolutionary change. So another way of saying that is which one is the most parsimonious of the two evolutionary trees here. And hopefully we're able to figure out this is just showing one evolutionary change. So this is the one we're gonna we're gonna go with here. And this is part of the reason why we've we've changed our reason our lines of thinking to show that birds and mammals are more closely related than birds are to any other class of um, vertebrate. All right, another example of that in action, you know, typically you think of crocodiles, everybody's like, oh, this is the big thunder lizard. Well, the thing is, I may have gotten that messed up, I'm sorry. Uh, the crocodile, when we look at molecular similarities now, actually has more DNA in common with birds than it does with some of the other reptiles. You know, most of your lizards and most of your snakes. So there are some breakdowns in our current classification system. Now that we've been able to run um, these molecular studies, we're finding out that the morphological differences that were used for the basis of classification, there are some errors that have occurred in that. And so there are some changes that are going on at this time in the world of classification. All right. This is kind of a cute little cartoon. I'll let you guys check that out. But now that we've been able to look at all this, we've been able to determine that humans and mice have 99% of their genes in common. That is incredible. But we use that as degrees of relatedness. That shows that we are very much related to mice in terms of our DNA structures. 50% of our genes closely match the genes of a standard yeast. So the stuff you throw into your bread for being able to make it rise, that living organism, we have 
similarity in our genes as they did. And so more evidence that we've evolved from very simple eukaryotes, so organisms that have a nucleus that is well defined. I, one of the other neat things I've been able to do with this, and I'll be honest, I'm not a, a big expert on molecular clocks, but this is relatively um, new stuff and we didn't really study this much when I was in, in school. We've been able to go through now and we can actually track changes that have occurred in a particular uh, organism and use that to help backtrack to see what or um, how long ago that particular organism evolved. So um, better for me to point it out on here. This is showing all the different strains of HIV. All right, so you can see here and the, the differences in their DNA sequence. Okay, so we put all that on here and when they were, we also include when they were discovered. So HIV really became a big thing um, in the early 80s and really came into the spotlight. Well, we've been able to document that there are various variations or um, mutations that have occurred in the virus. And so when we take all that and plot it, if we do a line of best fit, we can actually continue to follow this line on down. And what this shows us is that HIV first evolved sometime, or most likely sometime in the 30s, but we can apply a range, we can um, expand this out a little bit most likely evolved sometime in the, um, between the 20s and the 40s. Do we have any documented proof of that? No, but based upon the, the variations that we're seeing today, we can extrapolate back and get a pretty decent estimate as to when these actual um, organisms, or in this case a virus, evolved. What kind of a neat thing. Right? So when we look at life on Earth and we look at the origin of life, all right, we can track four major changes, four major evolutionary events that occur. So we all started out, uh, according to evolutionary theory, we all started out as um, single-celled organisms. At one point, a single-celled uh, single organism had a mutation occur in it that resulted in that um, prokaryotic cell becoming eukaryotic. And explains that here, possible fusion of bacterium and an archaean, yielding the uh, an early ancestor of eukaryotic cells. So they believe two bacteria, one bacteria essentially engulfed another one, and then as a result, you started getting separation of um, essentially compartmentalization, I think is better the word, terminology it uses, inside um, the, or one of the bacteria. There's a, there's a name for this. We call this endosymbiotic theory. We'll get into that a little bit later on when we get into the cells. All right, then another, so then now we have two, we have the bacteria, your prokaryotic cells, and now you're getting your early eukaryotic cells. All right, so then when this occurs, you have another branch that starts to come off from it. All right, then if you follow the eukarya, the eukarya tree, we start to see some of it's a symbiosis of mitochondrial ancestor with an ancestor of eukaryotes. So now we're starting to get, uh, rather than the primitive energy acquisition that they were using, you're starting to get the development of a mitochondria that's, a, once again, it's compartmentalized, but it's more effective at being able to utilize available uh, food sources. And so you get uh, more energy output out of it, similar to what we see in our cells today. Then another evolutionary event occurred where the chloroplast had a similar thing happen as the um, mitochondria didn't mix it. We're going to get this a lot more when we get into the cells. But you can see looking at this tree, some uh, the four major evolutionary things that have happened um, over the history of time. All right, so let's look at what your assignment actually is. Let's again go to tigers. Let me get to the, the document here. You're going to go through and make a cladogram. All right. When you make a cladogram, what you first need to do is go through and determine what are the characteristics of all the organisms that you're looking at. And what you're looking for is what similarities do you have. So in this example, I have a shark, I have a bullfrog, a kangaroo, and I have a human. 
and the characteristics I'm looking at are I'm looking at vertebrae, I'm looking at two pairs of limbs, I'm looking at mammary glands, and I'm looking at placenta. The first thing I want to do is create a um, uh, Venn diagram. All right, my suggestion is take the thing that has the most characteristics and put that in the middle. So I have my human. The one thing that makes a human different is its placenta. So the middle characteristic is the placenta of the human. Or you, you can also do this opposite. Take the most primitive one, put that on the very outside with its characteristic. It doesn't matter which direction you want to go with this. I guess I'm going to go from outside in. So then when I look at this, all these organisms have vertebrae. So everything's going to be inside of this one circle now. Then the bullfrog was the first organism it looks like to have two pairs of limbs because that's the only characteristic that it has um, that's not the same, or that's, how do I want to say this? It's the only characteristic that it has in common with all of these that have evolved beyond it. So now the bullfrog is going to go in the next circle in my Venn diagram. Then the next in the mammary glands, the kangaroo is the next most simple, so that one goes in the next circle. And finally, it's the placenta uh, with the human in the middle. Use this to help guide you. I understand I am not explaining this very well right now on the computer. I, I'm toast right now. So um, uh, I'm going to let you guys play with that a little bit. But then what you're going to do is you're going to take the results of your Venn diagram. And let me make this a little bit smaller so you can just pull from the same screen. And put it onto, essentially, onto a timeline. So the first characteristic that evolved, we see our vertebrae. So everything above the line where you put vertebrae means it has vertebrae. Then the next evolutionary change is two pairs of limbs. So I'm going to put a line, two pairs of limbs. Now, only organisms that have two pairs of limbs are going to be above that line on my cladogram. All right? Then I'm going to put a line for mammary glands. Only things that are mammary glands are going to be above that line. So you notice the bullfrog goes in between the two pairs of limbs and the mammary glands lines because it does have two pairs of limbs, but it doesn't have mammary glands. And so on and so forth. So you're then going to go through and do the same, but yours is a little bit more difficult. You have all these organisms. And I want you to go through and create a cladogram of these organisms. There should be uh, plenty of scrap paper underneath the Elmo uh, in the classroom. Just take one of those um, Scantron sheets, flip it over, and you can do your cladograms on that. All right, this is going to serve as your Chapter 25 study guide. So when you're done, uh, you, you're welcome to turn it in. I, I'm not going to be able to get to it over the weekend because I'm going to be back to, to grab those papers. But I would like to look at them prior to you taking the test and just to make sure you guys are getting it. So I'm probably going to collect them on Monday. So if you don't get them in, done in class, you're going to want to make sure you get it done at home. When you're done with that, you're welcome to spend your time working on your labs if you have those back, or you can spend time working on your study guides. Right? Like I said, if you have any questions, make sure you write them down. You can ask them to me. If um, whoever's covering our class today is willing to let you text them to me, you're welcome to text them uh, your questions to me as well, as um, I'm in a meeting, and so it shouldn't be a big deal for me to, to get back on that. All right? Hope you guys have a great weekend, and uh, keep in mind, go Tigers!